Hi, I'm Israel Wayne. I'm an author and conference speaker. One of the things that I'm really passionate about is helping people to see how the Lordship of Jesus Christ extends over all areas of life. My ministry tends to touch on three distinct areas, the family, the church, and the general culture. In the family, it's my desire to see fathers and mothers teach, train, and disciple their own children in the ways of the Lord, teaching them to know, love, and serve God, and to love and serve other people. In the church, it's my desire to see the authority of Scripture reign paramount and to see a sense of Christian community return to the body of Christ. In the general culture, my desire is through worldview and apologetics training to help people to see how God's Word applies and extends to all areas of life, including politics, education, economics, religion, social issues, the arts, media, entertainment. It's my desire to help people to think and live biblically. I'm excited about the possibility of partnering together with you to see this message go out to the world around us. Thank you and God bless you. As we read back through the account of Jacob and Esau, we see several factors in the conflict between the two siblings, some of which you may very well observe in your own kids. First of all, parental favoritism. Isaac loved Esau. Rebekah loved Jacob. Presumably, they both loved both their boys, but there was favoritism going on. That is one of the things that will damage a child so very much. Most of us have felt it. Most of us have thought, oh, mom likes them better than me. How many of you ever thought that? Mom or dad likes my brother better. Yeah. How many of you were sure your mom and dad like your brother? How many of your parents told you? That? Never mind that. <clears throat> Parental favoritism. Our kids are always charging that, aren't they? Oh, you like him better than me? You of course, in my house, the favorite one is, well, you didn't let us do that when we were the little kids. Yeah. Well, what can I say? My reply to that is I cannot make life fair. It ain't that way, and I can't fix it. So we do the best we can. Besides, they can't drive either, and you can't. There was also a genuine offense. Isaac, excuse me, Jacob did snooker Esau. Now, Esau asked for it. I mean, the boy was, I mean, lights are on. Nobody was home with that boy. I mean, he did some dumb things. But Jacob was happy to take advantage of that and even facilitate that to grease his own pockets. So we have two things. We have parental favoritism, which always causes problems. Then we have a genuine offense. A third thing we have is we have a bent or broken authority structure in the home. We have a woman who chose to do an end run around her husband's clear wishes and it cost her both her children. Because when her, when her older boy got angry at the younger boy and promised to kill him, Instead of getting on her knees, humbling herself before God and her husband and her boys and saying, come on, let's, let's fix this. Let's work something out. Let's ask God for a solution. She avoided the consequences or thought she did. She said to her little boy, now therefore my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran, and tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turns away. A few days? She doesn't know boys very well, does she? Till thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget that which thou hast done to him. People don't forget. A few days, as far as we know, he left on a trip for a few days, and she never saw her boy again. Uh, Proverbs 3.12, even as a son, even as a father, the son in whom he delights. Psalm 37.23 is really neat. It says, the steps of a man are ordained by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Even when you fall, the Lord is there holding your hand. What a picture that is in training our children. Even when they fall, we need to be there to help them up and delight in them. My son, Rick, um, had written this little poem, and, and he, I'll just read to you what he said, part of it. 
He said, I will confess that in making life decisions, I ought to ask myself what God would think. Yet often I find myself asking, what would mom think? I want desperately for this lady to be able to be proud of me, to be a credit rather than an embarrassment to her. I've learned that if I filter my actions through the mom filter, most times I'm glad I did. But you know what? Your kids won't do that unless they know that you care more about them than you care about yourself. And you have to do that. I mean, you have to lay down your life to get your kids raised. Um, delight is a matter of the heart. It comes from deep within. Our children belong to the Lord. They don't belong to us. They belong to the Lord. And we need to handle them that way. So what do I mean in delighting? Practically, how do you delight in your kids? Well, what kind of attacks are there when it comes to the Tower of Babel? There's a lot, isn't there? Probably one of the most popular that we deal with in today's culture is the issue of racism, which comes out of, uh, heavily out of an evolutionary worldview. Now, racism was not, uh, it was around before an evolutionary worldview, but it increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary ideas in today's culture. But we need to get rid of this term races. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit uh, in brief on this particular subject because this talk is not going to go into this in great detail. We've got plenty of other resources, uh, plenty of other uh, lectures and materials, things like that that go into this. But if everybody came from Adam and Eve, how many races are there? One. There's only one race. In fact, as Paul uh, here in Acts 17, 26 says, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. There is only one race, which means we're all sinners, right? But I have had people say, but, but what about all those skin colors? There's other people that's, that's really dark. There's people that's really light. Friends, we could get that easily just from basic genetics. John 3, 12 says, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe when I speak of heavenly things? The context of this, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus and they've been talking about earthly things. And you know what? Nicodemus just really didn't, didn't quite grasp this stuff. And yet, he wanted to hear about the heavenly things. So often, we get so excited about the heavenly things. And that's good, don't get me wrong. But sometimes we neglect the earthly things. What we did in this talk is we talked about a lot of earthly things, didn't we? We saw maps and genealogies. Let's face it, that stuff can be kind of boring. But you know what? It explains the world. It is the authoritative word of God, and it makes sense in today's culture. Those are the earthly things. And you know what? Because those earthly things are true, that means the heavenly things in the Bible are also true, right? It really is. If the history is true, the message of the gospel is also true. And let's not miss this. I mean, we're talking about the Tower of Babel. We're looking at all these different questions that people have, and we're seeing how to answer those from a biblical perspective. We're looking at the earthly things. Friends, let's not miss the gospel in all this. Living fossils is just one of four simultaneous experiments that I carried out to test evolution. It was based on a simple prediction that if evolution was not true, and if animals did not change over time, I should be able to find modern appearing plants and modern appearing animals in the dinosaur rock layers. And this is in fact what I found. First I found a fossil shrimp in a dinosaur rock layer that looked very similar to a modern appearing gulf shrimp. Then I found a crayfish in a dinosaur layer that looked like a modern crayfish, then a crab, then a prawn, then a lobster. Soon I realized I had found all of the major crustacean groups in the dinosaur rock layers. Then I turned my attention to the insects. First I found a modern appearing dragonfly that was found in a dinosaur rock layer. Then a katydid, then a cockroach, then a cricket. And soon I had representatives of all of the major insect groups living today from the dinosaur rock layers and they looked the same. Then I had representatives of all the shellfish groups, the echinoderm groups, etc. And soon I realized that I had representatives of all of the major invertebrate phyla living today I'd found these in the dinosaur rock layers and they look the same. Next, I turned my attention to the vertebrates and here I ran into problems. 
Museums were, for the most part, not displaying the most important vertebrate fossils. They were kept out of the view of the public. So I turned to the literature and began interviewing scientists, asking if they had seen any modern appearing vertebrates with the dinosaurs. And lo and behold, they had. Dr. Clemens reported finding a modern appearing parrot in a dinosaur rock layer. Others reported finding ducks, loons, flamingos with dinosaurs. This was utterly amazing. And others reported finding shrew-like animals, squirrel-like animals, platypus-like mammals, and other mammals in the dinosaur rock layers. Now, I did not find any of the larger mammals in the dinosaur rock layers, but this could just as easily be explained by a misinterpretation of the geological layers, which I'll explain in the fourth video. Lastly, I turned my attention to the plants, and once again, I found representatives of all of the major plant divisions living today in the dinosaur rock layers, and they looked the same. Sequoias with dinosaurs, oak trees with dinosaurs, magnolias, dogwoods, etc. It was, it was amazing. Well, in the last hour, Ken had a chance to uh, show you how important it is uh, to really take a look at beginnings, at origins, to understand purpose and destiny. And so in this hour, it's my chance uh, to take you back to the beginning, all the way back to the beginning, as far back as you can possibly go, all the way back to the very beginning of time itself. Well, in the beginning was hydrogen. And at first, that hydrogen was pressed together in some kind of ball of matter. Then, for reasons we may never fully explain, that ball of matter exploded in a big bang that sent dust and gas and radiation into the ever-expanding reaches of our universe. Then, under the influence of gravity, particles began to come together to form galaxies. Within those galaxies, stars began to shine. Around those stars, cold material collected together to form planets. Of all the millions and billions of planets that must have been formed in a manner like this, one is this teeny chunk of rock we call home, the Earth. Well, at first, the Earth was quite different than it is now. Lightning flashed back and forth in an atmosphere of methane and ammonia for, for perhaps two billion years until finally, just by chance, a group of molecules got together that could reproduce and life on Earth began. About 600 million years ago, we pick up the first simple beginnings of life, like those little trilobites. About 400 million years ago, the first land plants and animals appear in the sequence. About four million years ago, those first apes take those upright steps toward becoming human beings. Well, human beings are the first animals who are able to look back over the history of how they developed. As we do so, we learn things that are helpful in understanding ourselves and our nature. Why is it that we do things that are harmful and hurtful to our own kind? Wars, crime, things like that. It's that jungle fight for survival that brought us into being in the first place. But we're not without hope. We're already beginning to take control of, of that molecule of heredity, DNA. We can begin to reshape ourselves into our own image of what man really ought to be. Man is already reaching for the stars. There's simply no limit to what man can do. Hmm. <laughs> Hands up all those who think that's a good summary of the opening chapters of Genesis as explained by Ken Ham. Yeah, okay. See, ushers, would you please? No. <laughs> Whether you look at the universe and look at the stars and see how magnificent they are, they all obey the same laws. These laws are universal. So who in the world would create these laws but an infinite God? In times past, Tom DeRosa would never have recognized God as creator. Tom was an absolute devout evolutionist. He would talk about us coming from apes. I departed the ways of what I was taught as far as the scripture was concerned, as far as God was concerned. 
And I started to look in terms of the worldview as Darwin and evolutionists would look at it. Although Tom DeRosa had been brought up in the Roman Catholic faith and considered becoming a priest while attending junior seminary as a teen, his perspective shifted after he went off to college and was challenged by a friend to read Charles Darwin's controversial book, The Origin of Species. And at that point, I started to question, uh, really, if the Bible is true, then how can I accept biology class? After college, as a young teacher, Tom quickly rose as a leader in the public school district where he was working and devoted himself wholeheartedly to teaching what he believed was the ultimate in scholarly science, evolution. It just focused on the fact that kids had to hear evolution because that was true. And they needed to be taken away from the crutch of God and believing in God. Tom had become an atheist, and his passion for teaching evolution became his idol. But that passion began to fade when the school district where he taught made some drastic changes in the science program. They took my science away. The school board voted that we're, instead of having a full year, we're going to have a half year of science. It was the summer of 1978 when Tom began to reconsider his teaching career. During that period, a private school in Fort Lauderdale was in dire need of a physics and chemistry teacher. I knew nothing at all about Tom DeRosa. <laughs> Dr. Ken Wackus was the headmaster of Dr. D. James Kennedy's Westminster Academy, a school dedicated to teaching biblical principles and creation science. When they called me up, they said, Tom, do you know of a chemistry and physics teacher? Can you recommend one? And I carefully thought. And after a while, I couldn't think of one right offhand. And I just said, me. And I thought, oh my goodness, what is he doing now? So I got off the phone and he said to me, I'm going to Westminster Academy to interview. And I think it was in a week or something uh, for this job. And I said, you, you can't do that, Tom. You're an evolutionist. I said, why? She says, do you know that this is a Christian school? This is Dr. Kennedy's school. This is Westminster Academy. This school is well known. You have to be a Christian to teach at this school. I said, well, doesn't mean you sign a piece of paper? She said, no. So I called everyone I knew, and we set up prayer chains to, to pray for Tom that day of, of the interview. Just that, you know, things would go well. So when I was in the office with Dr. Ken Wackus, he told me what a Christian was, and I was expecting to hear the same thing. But for some odd reason, he told me that a Christian was one that believed in the free gift of eternal life. I think what got to him was the understanding for the first time perhaps in his life that you don't work your way into the kingdom of heaven. It's not by being good. It's not by being religious. I was always taught that I had to work, work, work for your salvation. But the fact that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for me and I didn't have to do it was an amazing concept. Hi, I'm Kristen, and I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about something that I'm very passionate about, and that's a biblical home education. Notice I didn't say a Christian education, because there is a difference. You see, a biblical education starts with the Bible. Other methods start with man's opinions, which is called secular humanism. I was surprised to read in the teacher guide of a popular Christian curriculum of a scripture verse followed with, but we believe. They then continue to contradict the verse just given. This is an example of what some may consider to be a Christian curriculum, but it is not biblical. They are starting with man's opinions as the authority rather than God's word. You also may be surprised that not all authors of Christian homeschool curriculum believe in the biblical account of creation. They do not believe that God created the earth and all that is in it in six 24-hour days resting on the seventh. Some go so far as to say that Adam and Eve never even existed and the whole historical account of the Old Testament is purely figurative. Are these who you want writing the educational materials for your family? I encourage homeschoolers to look past the Christian labels. Take a look not only at the materials themselves, but also at the worldview of their authors and publishers. 
So what is worldview? Worldview is simply what we believe to be true. It is the philosophies that guide our life. For example, Columbus believed the earth was round. This belief became his navigation system, which charted the course of his life. Worldviews are not neutral. They are either true or false. If Columbus had believed the false worldview in his day that the earth was flat, the course of his life would have been different. The course for the rest of history would have been different. Everyone has a worldview. The question is whether or not it is correct. Let's take a look at the most common worldview starting with the biblical worldview that says absolute truth exists. God exists. The Bible is not only true, but it is the foundation for our life and our philosophies. It is our navigation system which we use to chart the course of our life. Humanism and its cousins, naturalism and postmodernism, say there is no absolute truth. Think about that. How do they know that's true? They say that God doesn't exist, or if he does, he only got things going, and now it's all up to us. Pantheism is the foundation of the Eastern religions, New Age, things like reincarnation and karma. They say everything living is God. I'm God, you're God, the bugs are God. Humans, animals, insects are all equal and working to obtain a higher divine level. So why does worldview matter? Think about some well-known people and how their worldview not only affected the course of their life, but also the world. We already mentioned Columbus and how his worldview charted the course of his life. Noah's belief that God means what he says saved his life. Paul is a great example of how a change in worldview can alter the course of a life. Paul's life was polar opposite before and after his conversion. Let's think about how worldview affected Hitler, Stalin, or Churchill. How about Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, or Ken Ham? How about the average homeschool mom and dad? Worldview directs the course of a life, and sometimes all of world history. Isn't this why we homeschool? We want to establish in the lives of our children the navigation system that has truth as the foundation. We must be vigilant to make sure our materials teach a biblical worldview. We have the ha evidence in biology hands down in practically every area of biology I know of, whether you're talking about the macro scale, you're talking about migration of, of the monarch butterfly, which is just, these are amazing things, or the migration of birds from Alaska to some island <laughs> out in the Pacific, you know, and the cell, uh, tremendous evidence that there is a creator. And then we're finding out that, that the mechanism of evolution, mutations and natural selection, just doesn't work. You're going to hear more about that uh, at this conference. This conference is going to mainly focus on, on biology, but I'll be doing uh, material on geology. It's in geology that I, they especially uh, have this so-called evidence against the Bible. They threw out the, the global flood in the 1700s with the Enlightenment. And, uh, and they relegated the flood, first of all, to the surface features called diluvium. And finally, they found out those were mostly due to the Ice Age. So the flood disappeared in the late 1700s. Practically all scholars believed in an old earth and uh, slow processes over millions of years. Late 1700s. I read the history of all this in two huge books by Martin Rudwick last summer, uh, The History of Geology from uh, 1780 to 1840. You're going to hear a lot about biology and that, that the evidence is so strong in biology that, there, that uh, as Romans 1.20 says, that, that when we pass away to the next world, no one's going to have an excuse to say that they didn't have enough evidence or that uh, uh, they didn't know that God existed, because Romans 1.20 says that it's, it's understood by the things that are made out there, the creation. So here's uh, statements like this, and this is by a retired professor of geology at Calvin College. You go to most major evangelical conservative colleges, and you'll find out that they believe in evolution there, they believe in a local flood, and so forth, because they've, they've bought into what the world has said, that there's no evidence for the flood. This is a statement, uh, there is no geological evidence to confirm the idea of a universal deluge. So you hear statements like that. 
What, what should we do as Christians? Well, this is my theme verse for research. Examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. I'm going to hold fast to the Bible as God's word. And Jesus is my Lord and Savior. But then I'm going to examine things carefully. And you've got to do this. This should be a rule of life, because if you examine things at the superficial level, like in geology or paleontology, you'll learn just enough to snow yourself. And this is one of the problems. You've got to dig below the surface. And that's one of the reasons I go out and look at the rocks. Matthew 4, 3, and the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. So Satan comes along, I'm willing to consider the hypothesis that you're the son of God, but let me, let's see some evidence here, okay? And you know, after all, that would be a reasonable thing to do. If you're really the son of God, you could do that. It's not that Satan really doubted that Christ is the son of God, of course, he knew that. He just wanted to see if he could get Christ to appeal to his standard, to deviate from scriptural authority. Does Jesus fall for that? Does Jesus say, yeah, okay, that sounds pretty reasonable. We can leave the Bible out of the discussion and just talk about evidence, and I'll prove to you that I'm the Son of God. Now, he could, have, he could have done that, but that's not what he did. That's not what he did. He didn't leave the Bible out of the discussion. He quoted Scripture, he said, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He quoted Scripture. He's quoting Deuteronomy 8.3, and the very Scripture he's quoting tells us that we're to rely upon God's authority. As, as, as we rely on food to live, we're to, re we're to rely on God's Word uh, to, to live as well. God's standard are man's. The Bible teaches that we must start with God's standard in order to know anything. And we read verses like Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Colossians 2, 3, in Christ are deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If we, if, uh, if we embrace a philosophy that is according to the world, we'll be robbed of those treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible makes that very clear, that we're to start with God's standard or we can know nothing. And so the evidentialist attempts to show that the Bible is true using another ultimate standard. But the Bible teaches that there is no other ultimate standard. You see the problem with that? If you could prove the Bible from another ultimate standard, then the Bible isn't true. Because it says it's the ultimate, right? The fear of the Lord's the beginning of knowledge. So effectively, the evidentialist attempts to show that the Bible is the ultimate authority by starting from the assumption that it isn't. Now, that approach is not going to work, is it? You can't, you can't, through correct logical reasoning, end up with a conclusion that contradicts your initial premise if you have a true premise. Titus 1.9, we're to hold fast the faithful word. We're to stand on the authority of God's word, both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. And we'll be accused of circular reasoning. But you need to understand, first of all, this is what Christ did. This is what Paul did. And so no matter what people say, we're to follow their example. Is this circular reasoning? The presuppositionalist stands on the authority of the Word of God to defend it. Is this fallacious? Is it circular? And so I want to deal with this now. Circular reasoning. Two points I want to make about circular reasoning. First of all, when it comes to an ultimate standard, some degree of circular reasoning is unavoidable. That may surprise you, but it's true. Some degree of, of circular reasoning is unavoidable when you're dealing with an ultimate standard. And secondly, it's not fallacious. It's not a vicious circle. Remember when we talked about uh, laws of logic and we talked about... Uh, the uh, logical fallacy of begging the question or circular reasoning, it's very unusual because it's valid. It's the only fallacy that is, in a sense, not a fallacy because it doesn't, uh, the, the conclusion does follow from the premise. There's no break in the chain of reasoning. every public school in America who is trained as a witness for Jesus Christ. When you send that child off to school today, you're sending them into a pagan society. And in the studies are showing that there's virtually no discernible difference between the church and the world. At what point is Southern Baptist going to rise up and say, enough is enough? 
Whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. We've got to do something different. The schools are failing. I would go to six or seven days a week, not just Monday through Friday. They are stealing our children. But because they are leaving the body of the child with us, we don't even know what's happening. If I had my way, government education would be brought to a halt. Trying to fix public education is like trying to teach a pig how to dance. You get dirty and the pig gets mad. Turning your children over to total strangers and having those strangers work on your child's mind, it's a mad idea. Public schools have become a criminal enterprise. Parents are willing to admit that there are these problems and yet believe that their children will somehow escape. They won't. And it may have taken a school shooting to wake us up to see the danger, but that's a very small danger compared to all the other things that go on that can destroy our children. A teacher is in trouble for bringing a religion into his classroom, but should he lose his when job? When we go into a public school, we have to leave God at the door. It just came to the point where I couldn't do that anymore. Jesus said, build your house upon the rock, but the foolish man refused the words of Christ, would not build their education systems on the fear of God, on the words of Christ. Everything exists to proclaim the glory of God. And the one place where we send our kids seven hours a day is a place where God's name can't be mentioned. It's not indoctrination, it's insanity.